Allow me to now introduce Nicole Banowitz. Thank you everyone for having me tonight. I'm really excited to talk to you about the theme of surreal in my work. So um, I was invited to speak today partially because I have this installation right now in the dam and it's perfect that it's in this spot so you can check it out afterwards. Um, when I was originally asked to talk about surreal, there was a moment where I felt kind of unsure about the theme because my work is really based in the natural world. It's based in a lot of scientific imagery and things that are very much real. And so there was a moment where I was like, maybe I'm not the right speaker for this topic. But as I sat with it for a moment, I realized that half of my artist statements use the word surreal to describe my artwork. So I, I thought that was interesting. There's sort of this dissonance between the idea of surreal and the feeling of surreal for me. So I started to look at like what is surreal? And when you look first at surreal, it's defined through the art movement of surrealism. And surrealism is a, a movement from the early, early 20th century. And we all know a lot of the artists that made surrealism. Two of these examples, this is Dolly and Magritte. And the idea of the surrealist is they're really interested in just taking everyday objects and mixing them up in a way that you wouldn't expect. So you have something like a fireplace and a train and a clock, and these are all things you would see in your everyday life. But they pull you in and then you see like, oh, these are mixed up. So the first thing is there's something that you recognize. And that's the great thing about surrealism is that it appeals to everyone because we recognize something in it that we can feel comfortable thinking about. So it's sort of like a hook and it pulls us in. And then suddenly we're like, wait, this isn't what we thought. These things are mixed up. It doesn't make sense. And so suddenly there's a question. And I'm really interested in the question. And I think early surrealism was kind of interested in these like random objects pulled out of our subconscious mind, whereas I'm more interested in a curated question. Um, so I went kind of further to another kind of simple um, definition of surreal, and it's just that it's strange because we're mixing things that aren't usually found in reality. And for me, it's really about taking things from reality and mixing them together. So this first piece of mine I'm going to talk about, it's called Rhinos and Sea Anemones Fighting. Mm -hmm. And I think it's actually probably my most like straightforwardly surreal piece because I'm taking two things that don't belong together and I'm mixing them together. And so maybe in like traditional surrealism, it might just be something that I had a dream about once. But I, I'm more interested a little bit in like storytelling. So I'm hoping people see, oh, there's a rhino. Like I recognize that. Now I'm interested. And they start to question, like, what is the story the artist wants to tell? And specifically in this piece, I'm really interested in the rhino because I think it's this beautiful, majestic, strong animal. And it has this horn. And this horn is this kind of magical symbol to a lot of cultures. And when we think of the rhino, we think of this strong animal because of the horn. But the rhino doesn't actually have many predators other than humans. And the only reason humans really want to kill the rhino is for this horn. So the thing that when we first look at it seems like the rhino's strength is actually the rhino's vulnerability. And so I thought that this is a really kind of beautiful creature that has this really sad poetic story. And so um, I, I was working for a while at the Houston Zoo installing a light show. And I would watch these rhinos play every day. It was like three sisters. And one day I was watching the rhinos, and they're like really gently playing. And this little kid comes up and is like, Dad, what are the rhinos doing? And the father was like, the rhinos are fighting. And I thought it was really interesting, this kind of mixed feeling of like, oh, is it playful? Is it fighting? Is it aggressive? And generally, rhinos are pretty um, gentle beings in comparison to something like a hippo, which is actually much more aggressive. But I wanted to look into nature and find something that was aggressive that maybe didn't look aggressive. So sea anemones are actually, they look really ephemeral, soft, and flowy, but they're like very, like they are very aggressive. So they fight to protect their territory, and like sea anemones fight really dramatically. So I wanted to mix these two kind of completely opposite animals in a way that was sort of interesting and surreal, and talk about what kind of preconceived notions humans put onto other creatures based on the ways that they look. So in that realm, I'm really interested in using surrealism to question. And one of my favorite artists is Patricia Piccinini. And she actually lectured here a couple years ago, and I saw her in this very lecture hall. But she's one of my favorites because she doesn't just mix up images like she doesn't just take you know, a train and a fireplace and put it together. She takes 
emotions and these like human relationships and mixes them together. So in all these images, you see this relationship of love. There's some kind of caring. It's like a mother and a child, or it's a friendship. And these are things that are so natural and so normal for us as humans. But then she throws in this creature that's like very surreal, something that's like maybe half dog, half human, half pig. And suddenly you've got this discomfort and this question of like, why, why are these things different than I expect? Why does that make me feel uncomfortable? So she really wants us to think about why we have these feelings about things that maybe look different from us. She did this project that I think is really interesting where she collaborated with science. Because I think surrealism can be really interesting when it like starts from a point of science and then it kind of spins off in a new direction. This project is Graham. Graham was created by Patricia with a group of scientists to show what a human would look like if they were to evolve to live through car crashes. So our technology makes us able to make faster and faster cars all the time, but our bodies can't evolve as quickly as our technology. So the scientists designed Graham to live through car crashes. So when we're in a crash, our neck is really vulnerable. So we just get rid of the neck. We make his kind of <laughs> ribs come up around his head. So that's really great. Then if we were in a car crash, we'd be likely to break our nose if it hits something. So we just flatten the face. So there's nothing that's protruding. And then um, he also has the same size brain as a normal human, but he's got a lot of extra like layers of tissue and fluid in there to protect it. So now we have this kind of super, super human in a car. Um, he also has these like little packets in his um, chest that are almost like his own airbags, and they release fluid in the crash. So it's like a built-in airbag. <laughs> so they made this as a collaboration to kind of talk about the vulnerability of our bodies when it comes to speed and cars and how we should take driving a car really seriously, because it's something we do every day and it's actually very dangerous. Um, but I think that this is like a really great example of taking this like human form, making it really kind of bizarre and surreal, but you have this like message behind it and it makes you question like, what are we doing with our technology and where do we fall? Um, so from there, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, science fiction, because I think that science fiction is like a version of surrealism that starts in fact, and then it spins it in a way that it can ask these questions. And that's the kind of surrealism that, in my work, I'm interested in, because I want to base it so much in nature. Um, Mary Shelley wrote what's considered to be the first science fiction novel. The reason it's considered the first science fiction novel is because she's really interested in science and reality, not just fantasy. So not just taking completely random things and telling stories about it. She wants to think about, like, if we start on this basis of science, what could happen? So Frankenstein specifically I want to talk about because it's one of my main inspirations for my installation, which is upstairs, the incubation effect. So in this story, everyone knows the basic story, but the idea is that this creator, the scientist, makes life from these various parts of a human. So he creates. So I think as an artist, everyone that's an artist is sort of interested in this idea of Frankenstein, because it's what is our responsibility to the thing we create? When we bring this object or this life into the world, what is our responsibility? And so in the case of Frankenstein, the creator sees a monster from what he's created, and he treats this, this like new being as a monster. And if he had treated it caringly and taught it, it would have become this amazing intellect, become this amazing superhuman. But because he treats it like a monster, it becomes a monster. So in my installation, which is upstairs, I've created this sort of insect nursery. Um, and the idea is I wanted to think of like, what is a kind of vulnerable creature that is sort of like a baby, but is also kind of strange. So I was really interested in larvae. And I think larvae are great because they, they are like the young of a, of a creature. And they're tiny. But if you kind of make them larger, they become a little bit creepy, but a little compelling. You're like, oh, it's, it's sweet, but also kind of scary. I think they're pretty cute. But also, when you think about a maggot, it's one of the kind of most disgusting things you can think of as well. But um, I wanted to create this environment for all of these little larvae to live in and give people an opportunity to interact with them. And the people that interact with them, the guests of the museum, actually will impact what these larvae can become. 
So um, scattered around the installation are these stuffed larvae that are baby sized. So the idea is that you, you see this, this creature that you sort of recognize it, but again, I'm taking the context here, it's the scale, and I'm making it surreal. So it's like, yeah, I have some memory of interacting with a larva, but usually it's not the size of a baby that I would you know, cradle and hold. And so I'm, I'm changing the scale, but then I'm also asking for the audience to get, make a drawing for me of what it is that this larva is going to become. So there's these laboratory tables where you can sit down and you can make a petri dish drawing of your creature. So I'm also saying, like, as the audience, the way you choose to interact with this installation is going to affect what it becomes. So if you're kind to the creatures, then they might turn into these helpful insect monsters. Or maybe if you're not kind to them, they'll turn into something more scary. So I'm giving that possibility to people. So I've started collecting these drawings, and I'm going to make new pieces that come back into the museum based on what the audience has drawn. So the audience actually has the power to impact this installation. And I think that the drawings I've gotten so far are so amazing, and there's hundreds of them. And the thing I think that makes them so great is because of the power of the surreal. Because what I'm doing is I'm creating this environment that has this basis in reality. So everyone that goes in there can connect and say, I understand insects, I understand cocoons, I understand larvae. But then because I'm using crazy colors, I'm messing with scale, it's really surreal and unexpected. So that gives them the freedom to make something crazy. So if someone wants, they can draw a perfect insect or they can draw this like multi-eyed monster. Everything is accepted. And so it's this really warm environment that's really open and creative. Now I'm going to talk about some of my other work. This is a piece called Distended Defense, and it's a piece that I wear. So the, the fans and the battery are actually inside of the backpack that I'm wearing that's encased in inflatable sculpture. Um, so again, this is sort of inspired by the insect world. I'm really interested in these behaviors that animals have. They're called diametic behaviors. And these are behaviors where the, the prey is tricking the predator. So the idea is the predator could actually eat the prey, but because of some sort of trickery, it gets away. So eye spots are a really good example because it makes the butterfly look really large when it's actually just a small insect. Caterpillars that have multiple like they look like they have multiple heads, so you can't tell if the, the predator can't tell if the prey is looking at it or not. Mm -hmm. And then also just acting larger than you are. A lot of insects will display and dance around as though they're much stronger and bigger than they are. And so this, this inflatable that I made is similar in that I have my human kind of head that's behind the mask. I have my arms and legs. But then I have all of these giant inflatable appendages. And you don't know, are they heads? Are they tails? It's very confusing. And also, the whole thing is made out of fabric and air. So in reality, any predator could just come up and attack me. There's nothing about the inflatable that would really protect me. So the other thing about surrealism that I think is great is that you can go into the world and find things that are actually in the natural world that feel really surreal. So I'm really interested in like finding those stories that I can tell to people that are actually real but have that whimsical quality. So slime molds are one example that I really love because they're kind of uncategorizable. Like they've been categorized as fungus and animals and all these things and we can't quite figure out what they are and they're able to move around, and they just look like these kind of slime blobs, but they can have a memory, and they can make decisions, and they're really great at mapping things. So they, if you take a map and you put food in places that are most highly populated, and you just let the slime mold go, it will map the most efficient route. So in 26 hours, the slime mold can map the route of the Tokyo metro system almost exactly. They're a little bit different. And this is a thing that would take you know, human engineers a lot of planning, a lot of education to figure out. So I think that it kind of draws, brings into attention of like, oh, what is our idea of humans as intelligence? Like, if this little kind of slime could be just as smart as a human, I feel like that makes us feel a little uncomfortable. It feels a little strange. <laughs> and so I really like stories like that. So I made this um, slime mold. It's a giant slime mold that was displayed in the Amsterdam Light Festival. So it's hanging above the canal, kind of oozing through the trees. This is about like 30 feet by like 20 feet or 40 feet by 20 feet. That's it in my backyard before I took it. Um, and it's 
just glowing in the night. So you just come across this bizarre thing and the lights sort of seep out as though it's like moving through the night. So I think it's great because you start with this really bizarre image of like, what is this thing that's glowing? And then it draws people in so they'll hear the story about the slime mold. Um, the other thing that the slime mold has inspired is a B movie that we all love called The Blob. So I think it's, it's a great thing that these things that are so based in reality can like spin off in these really bizarre turns. Because in The Blob, there's a, an asteroid that like hits Earth and it has this basically a slime mold on it. And the slime mold just grows and consumes things. And it's basically just like a slime mold. <laughs> Another thing that I'm really interested in from the world is plant communications. So we as humans are very human-centric, so often we'll get um, kind of surprised by the fact that other kinds of creatures or beings have this, these kinds of communications. So just in the fact that we think about like, oh, plants are talking to each other, that seems surreal to us, even though it might be complete reality. So scientifically, the trees in a forest, they're connected through these kind of fungal networks. And it's a symbiotic relationship where the trees give the fungus a kind of like uh, energy and photosynthesis, but then the fungus spreads messages for the trees. So for example, if there's some sort of insect predator, then one kind of one plant can send that message out to other plants so they can get their defense mechanisms ready. The other thing um, that's there's a book called The Hidden Life of Trees that really poetically talks about plant relationships. And there's this really sad and beautiful story about this, the trees and how they are all kind of supporting each other and they create this family. And when one tree is cut down, that's very important to this like family structure of the forest, the other trees will keep that trunk alive. So this is actually a picture of a tree that these trees were partners. And when that tree was cut down, this other tree will send energy through its roots to keep this stump alive. And I think that's really, really, really beautiful, but also kind of strange when you think about it. And so I did this piece called Concerning Plants. And to me, it's this kind of mythic conversation that plants are having that are kind of uncomprehensible to us as humans. Like, we can't really understand how they're communicating. So I wanted to make this really playful, whimsical illustration of it. And this was in the Breckenridge Arts Festival that was in the summer. So it's actually up on a trail. So you hike for a few minutes into the forest. And suddenly, you come across these giant, white, strange, alien plants. Um, and they're all, they all have these kind of tendrils. I want them to feel like they're reaching out to each other. There's like uh, three or four of these large pieces throughout the forest, and you're just walking through. So it does have this really bizarre feeling. You're like, how did these get here? Um, and as I, these were all on battery power. So I was going in and out a lot, like changing the batteries, interacting with people that were there. And this man came up to me, and he, he said to me, you know, I don't understand art. I don't really like art. But I understood one thing of your piece. And he like went like this. And he was like, I understood the ET moment. <laughs> and there's this moment in my piece where these, the two plants, it's because it's about this plant connection and communication. The plants, I sewed them together so that they're touching. And it's sort of this like parental plant and this like kind of spread out root bulb that's like the baby plant. And this man who, who told me, like, you know, I don't know about art. He got the whole communication of the whole piece by seeing that like moment of touch and connecting it to ET. So I think that that's like a really powerful thing that like surrealism can do because people who are normally like I'm a little intimidated by art, I don't want to think about it. I think by using surrealism and using whimsy, you're able to like put something out there that they sort of recognize and can grab onto. And when they grab onto that, they're really open to that story. So I think as creatives and artists it's really important to think about how we can bring people in because everyone's creative and everyone can understand art, but there's a barrier in our society where people kind of shut off and are afraid. So I think using like these surreal images from reality is a really great way to pull people in. Um, then I, I had to give a couple kind of more sci-fi examples of plant communication. So there's, you know, a very campy, little shop of horrors where there's a plant that comes from you know, the alien world and he eats blood and Seymour, who's this kind of sweet dorky guy, keeps him alive and he grows bigger and bigger and then is you know, ready to take over the world. Um, and I think, again, we've got this like, the 
science fiction is really great at taking these things that are slightly real and making them just outrageous and crazy so we can start to think about like what does it mean if plants could communicate. Um, Jeff Vandermeer's Annihilation is a really amazing series of books. I don't know the movie as well, but one of the ideas is that there's this, this area X that's taking over and it's growing and growing. And there's a moment where this scientist is there and she breathes in. There's this like fungus that's spread throughout the whole place. And she breathes in the spores and she becomes a part of that fungal network herself. And there's this moment where you don't know if like, is this a positive thing or a negative thing? Is she a host for a parasite? Or has she become part of this network where she's now enlightened? So I think, again, these like questions are really interesting. And by starting with science and then taking these like outrageous situations, we can ask really interesting questions. Um, I'm going to kind of speed through some of these so we can have questions at the end. Um, but another thing I like to do is just literally look into the world and find imagery that's kind of bizarre and interesting and change like the scale and the context. So these, for example, are stomach bacteria and smallpox. And I made this, this large installation that's on a building. So I'm basically just taking these tiny microscopic viruses and bacteria, and making them really large, and changing the context. So instead of in your body, they're like over a building. And just by the nature of that, it's creating this bizarre kind of feeling, and I'm able to play with this idea of these tiny things that are actually very dangerous, and then you make them large, and suddenly they're large and playful. And so, again, I think that inflatable specifically is really good with surrealism, because you can take things and make such j large pieces, and they're really eye-catching, and they feel just the inflatable itself, it feels solid and soft at the same time. So it has this really bizarre, surreal feeling just naturally. Um, other things that I've found in nature that I think are really interesting are uh, algae. So there's a piece I made called Out of the Bloom that's based off of an algae bloom. And so it's really great to just like look into nature and find these like bizarre, beautiful objects <coughs> or creatures and blow them up to a larger scale and change the color. There's just a lot of a beautiful things that you can just find. So these are a few examples of the different algae parts. And then um, I'm going to end with my favorite, which are rotifers. Rotifers are just bizarre and surreal in themselves. Like, you don't really have to do anything to them. And if you look at, like, science articles about rotifers, the word surreal is actually often in the science article because they are this, the strangest things. They're related. If people know better, like, water bears or tardigrades, they're, like, kind of the even more bizarre cousin of a water bear. So the thing that's interesting about them is that they can dry up. And when they dry up, they can kind of fly through the air to a new environment. So if they usually live in like ponds or puddles. So if their water source dries up or if there's like a parasitic fungus that comes, they don't have to worry about it. They just dry up, float away. And then when they're like floating around, they can shatter their DNA and like pick up things from the world that they want and need, which I don't really even understand. <laughs> but it makes them kind of like super creatures. And they're just so bizarre. They look like something out of like a strange uh, children's novel, kind of. Um, so I made a few installations about rotifers, because I really love them, and I think they're really interesting. And um, I did one at the Children's Museum here in Denver. And there's a series of rotifers that are sort of flying around the Children's Museum, because I think they're really whimsical and playful. And they're great for, for that kind of context. I also made it a piece for the light festival another year, the Amsterdam Light Festival. This piece is basically just a, an illustration of what rotifers do naturally. The pieces on the ground, the lights flash, and then they go dark. And then the ones in the building are on a chase sequence, so it looks like they're flying up into the air. So if you're in a city and you come across these giant, strange creatures, it feels really bizarre, but they're really just what are all around us and they're just tiny little animals. So the rotifers, I was curious if anyone had ever done a sci-fi inspired by rotifers. And when I searched, I found this short story by Robert Appernetti, who did like pulp sci-fi for like magazines in the 50s. 
And the story, it's funny because basically the story is just about rotifers because <laughs> it's like a little kid that gets a microscope and he goes out and he brings rotifers in from the pond and he becomes obsessed with them. And he goes and he makes drawings and he goes to the library and it's exactly what rotifers are, but he becomes obsessed and he thinks the rotifers are going to take over the world and like kill all the humans. And so he gets really sick and kind of delusional and at the end, he, his mom takes the rotifers from his bowl that he'd been looking at and takes them back to the pond and throws them out into the pond. But after this happened, the kid is like, no, the rotifers know about humans now. <laughs> and like, you have to destroy the rotifers in my bowl because they're gonna tell rotifers all over the world. <laughs> and it's like, so this is a really dramatic scene where the kid is like, telling us, like, you've got to kill them good because they don't mind being killed. And they lay lots of eggs, and their eggs can stand almost anything, even drying up. So it's like very scientific. And then the eggs remember what the old ones knew. So it's like <laughs> great because it's basically exactly reality, and you don't have to do much, and it becomes science fiction. <laughs> and so I kind of want to end there with this idea of like, there's so many interesting, beautiful, whimsical things out in the world. and you should kind of just try to pay attention to them and if you want to use them to help tell stories and get people questioning things, they're just, it's a great way to start a conversation is by using surrealism. So that's the end.